the Mikel Bridges extension, which is, you know, in my opinion, just inevitable at this point in time. But it does bring up something. Mikel Bridges extension affects New York's and their future plan. Now, I absolutely, 100%, believe the extension, just like Jalen's did, affects the Knicks and what they're going to do in the future. Now, if anybody doesn't know, living under a rock or don't know what Mikel Bridges does, what he makes or anything like that, let's go ahead and review it a little bit for everybody. So, uh, Knicks Mikel Bridges is expected to sign a team-friendly extension. After being acquired in the blockbuster trade with the Nets, uh, new Knicks Mikel Bridges is expected to follow Jalen Brunson's lead and sign a relatively team-friendly contract extension with New York when he becomes eligible to. And that's according to Mark Stein, a longtime NBA reporter. Stein writes, Bridges will be eligible for a less appealing 72.5 million two-year extension as of October 1st. And he will also be eligible for a more lucrative three and four-year extensions during the 2025 offseason. Either way, an extension isn't imminent since it isn't even currently permitted. The 10th pick of the 2018 draft, Bridges signed a four-year, 90 million rookie scale extension in 2021, which kicked in recently, and he will earn 20. 20- 3.3 million uh this coming season 24.9 million the following season and then they can work on an extension uh which would begin in the 2026 2027 year but that's where we are right now with Mikel Bridges and obviously Eddie as we just heard it is more likely than not that he's going to sign an extension with the Knicks now I think that's a good decision to make especially given the trade that you made I think I think now with all the picks that you gave up I think you're more forced to kind of give him the, the contract extension. Here's where the Knicks win, though. The Knicks give him that contract extension, Eddie, and it's at a discount. I think you can look at that trade again and say, you know what? I feel a lot different about it now because not only do we get a player and he's a significant piece, but we got him at a significant discount. And if this team is good for maybe two of those years and those picks fan out, I think this trade will be looked back at as one of the better trades the Knicks have made. For that, what do you say about that and Mikel Bridges is looming? Uh, extension coming up well I think it you know a lot of it comes down to what's going to happen with Randall first right I think Randall's the first domino right we're going to decide we're probably going to know after the interesting this year. Well, it's just sloppy there's interesting so you think that the Randall situation is going to be addressed before Mikel even has an extension talk I I well I believe that like you said I I think they already have a little handshake agreement under the table mm-hmm. like they did right. with Brunson Right. Uh, but I think Randall's going to be the first domino to fall because, you know, we have to know what we're going to get out of him this year. If this is a big year for Randall. It's a huge year because if he can stay healthy and he can get through the postseason and he performs in the postseason, that now changes everything, right? That changes our outlook. That's going to change his, you know, extension. It's going to change probably how much money he gets. But either way, Randall has been known to take team-friendly deals. And I believe if Randall performs this year, he's going to take a team-friendly deal next offseason. And I already think, like you mentioned, I think the Mikel Bridges thing was already signed the moment they made that trade. I think he said, I want to do whatever. He basically, he basically told the Nets that if you don't trade me to the Knicks, I'll go and sign there for nothing. So I do want to say he did deny that. But again, he did, <laughs> it's anybody's well, guess, but he did deny it. It's a good thing. He it's a good thing he denied it because he would have been costing himself a lot of money. But I think he meant that. I really do. So listen, I, I know that for me, I know Ian Bagley was the guy that reported it. And you know how it is for me when, when Ian Bagley or Fred Katz, the guys who cover the Knicks for a while cover it, and I these guys I've spoken to as well too about on the show. I have to I have to give it some cadence to say, you know what? I I believe it more than somebody else. When Bagley says that his team had some discussions about potentially indicating that he would leave if something didn't happen, I mean, again, it's, it's anybody's guess. I'm sure the truth is somewhere in the middle. Don't really know where it is. But I can say the extension, though. I think it happens. But my question to you for the follow-up the extension, though, is when do you think it happens? Obviously, you could sign the meager $77 million one if you wanted to um, at, on October 1st. If he did that, I mean, if he does that extension, I think the Knicks would – that would be that would be the biggest win ever. He's not going to do it, though. So what, but, but, but what do you think that extension is going to come into play? Do you think he gets signed right away? Do you think the Knicks wait? What happens there? When does that happen? I, I mean, listen, if, if him and Brunson are as close as they, they, you know, they're making it out to be, uh-huh. there's, a, there's a big – I'm not saying it's going to happen, but there's a good possibility 
maybe he does take that extension on October 1st because who in, the, who in their right mind thought that Brunson was going to take what he took over this summer? Nobody. Nobody. Everybody said he's going to wait till next year and get that, you know, what was it, $119 million, $113 million that he left on the table? Yeah. Um, I think there's a very good percentage that we see Mikel take that, take that extension in October. But, you know, the salary cap is going up. You know, everything rises each year. So I think they're going to toe the line with all these guys. So it wouldn't shock me either way if, 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 if Mikel took the bridge, took the extension on October 1st, I'd say it's 50 50. I'd say it's 50 50. It could happen or he might just wait. But either way, Troy, the, 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 you know, the salary cap goes up and we are, if you haven't noticed, we are going to make sure we are under that second threshold no matter what. Eddie, if you can, just for the audience a little bit, can you speak to why teams want to stay under that second apron and why it's so important? It's extremely important because there's so many stipulations that come with it. Okay, if you're over the second apron for two out of three se- two out of three seasons, seven years down the road, you lose your first round pick. Okay, if that pick is so, for example, it would be like right now. It would be our 2032 draft pick. That pick would be would, would be would be called a frozen pick. And let's say we had the first pick overall, yeah. we would automatically move to the 31st pick overall. So we would lose that pick essentially. So if you're if you're over that second threshold, then also you can't make trades. You have to match dollar for dollar. Okay, so if if there's any money where like let's say you know back in the in the past you could go within 10 20% and make a trade now if you're over that second apron Troy you have to match dollar for dollar on the contract if you don't you cannot make the trade also you can't sign buyout players there's a million other things too your your um the luxury tax is tripled almost so the owners and all like the MSG stake owners This is a business for them. They don't want to pay all that extra money. So there's a lot of reasons, you know, to be, to stay under that second luxury tax threshold. There's a million reasons, but the most important ones are the draft picks and the trade assets, you know, the trading things and also the buyout things. But look, that, that it's just common sense. Stay under it. Look at the teams that are over it. You know, Phoenix, they have no moves. That's it. That's their team. This is all they can do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is it. And they, they have a good team, but they don't have enough to win it all. Am I not, the, not, not in the West? No. no. Who else? Uh, Golden State. They're a mess. It's another one. Yeah. They, you have know, to, they, have, they have to trash their team in order to kind of stay. Like to your point, though, they have to, and, uh, you know, the, the funny part with the second apron thing, the reason why I think it's so interesting to mention, remember the Hawks with John Collins, mm-hmm. how they moved him? And the main reason they moved him was to essentially avoid the second apron because they didn't get anything for him. They no. legit got nothing for him. And uh, Utah, Utah took him on because they needed salary for the right, NBA to floor. fill, right, yeah. right to get yeah. to the floor. So they helped each other, but it was again, it's a really weird situation when it's it's the first time I think we really saw that second apron come to effect where a team was actively doing something on a player that about a couple of years ago. He was a very critical part to them going to the Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah. So to go from there to being traded basically for money, just yeah. to get off of my my team so I can get under the apron, it tells you exactly what Eddie's saying here is true. That second apron is no joke. If you enjoy these clips from Knicks Live, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so that way you never miss a new episode of Knicks Live. Thanks for watching, Nick fans, and until next time, peace.